we're always told how to say no and that good parents say no, but we're not given enough examples of what saying yes can look like. And, you know, watching a funny TikTok with your kid or just asking your kid what they did online today is something that we need a good um, a good paradigm for. And, and one of the experts in my book was saying, like, everybody knows what a soccer mom is or soccer dad. They bring the orange slices. They cheer on the sidelines. Like, they, <laughs> they say, great game. But what is a Minecraft mom? I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is Anya Kamenetz, education correspondent at NPR and author of The Art of Screen Time, an evidence-based guide for parents on what to do about kids and screens. She's interviewed pediatric and screen time experts to make sense of the research, and she's talked to hundreds of parents to find the best practices to help get your children's screen time under control. Anya has also spent the last two years reporting on the impact of closing schools during the pandemic and has tried to make sense of the consequences for an entire generation of students. Here's Anya Kamenetz. Anya Kamenetz, welcome to Offline. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so when I started this this show about um, all the ways the internet is breaking our brains, I was thinking a lot about uh, my own screen habits. Um, but now our son Charlie is almost two. Uh, so my <laughs> wife Emily and I are, are starting to think a lot about his screen time, uh, especially as he gets older. So you wrote a book in 2018 called The Art of Screen Time, uh, which is all about how families can balance uh, digital life and, and real life. Um, this obviously got a lot tougher during the pandemic, which I, I do want to get to because I know you've talked a lot and, and written a lot about that. But way back in the before times, uh, when you started writing the book, how much evidence-based research was there about kids and screens? And, and what did it say in general? So it's, it's really interesting thinking about kind of like the overlap about what you talk about and, and what I was doing with that book, because it really became a game of kind of like, what is the quality of evidence that we're basing our recommendations and our decision making on? Because everybody says, okay, follow the science. But when it comes to things like what is the impact of watching television or playing video games or watching mom and dad on their phones, we just don't have great evidence. Mm. And a really good reason for that is that um, you cannot randomly assign toddlers to watch television for 12 hours a day, right? It's like not ethical <laughs> right. to do that. <laughs> and so literally, like when it goes to things like uh, very simple things like does watching, you know, uh, a cartoon character hit another cartoon character make kids violent? We don't have good research on that because it's been considered unethical for decades to do true randomized controlled trials. That is interesting. And it, I saw you at, at, at somewhere say um, that even like the uh, Academy of Pediatricians, they have the, the, you know, no screens before two years old is the rule. And they basically said that they made, they kind of made that up. <laughs> Dr. So Dr. Victor Strasberger, who co-wrote that recommendation, said to me on the record in the book, there was no evidence, none. We made it up. It was just based on what we thought would be a good idea. Um, and they later kind of like backpedaled, soft pedaled that recommendation because we still don't have great evidence. Um, but what they what they realized was that we're making these guidelines and literally no one is following them. And so we're losing our credibility, which you kind of can t- draw a parallel right from like the COVID stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I, I remember that because it was, you know, Charlie was over one years old. I can't remember how old he was exactly, but we took him to the pediatrician. And I remember Emily said at one point, like, well, we don't have him in front of screens, but like, if I'm like in the kitchen for a second, if he's just watching like five minutes of something, that's okay, right? And the pediatrician was like, no, it is not recommended. <laughs> We're like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah. what are, what have you seen uh, in terms of evidence as like, like what are some of the risks of too much screen time for kids that are, that we know about? Okay. So um, I think it's really important that you kind of started by talking about your own screen habits because Literally the most important thing and some of the most innovative research, especially with little kids, has to do with the screen interference that's happening because really it's adults that are spending so much time on screens Uh. and um, children are modeling and watching us. And so the way that it kind of can interfere, um, there's there's pretty good research, for, for example, on the effect of background television. So when television is playing in the background, it causes a dramatic drop in, in parent-child conversation and interactions during playtime. Mm. And similarly, there's pretty innovative research. Dr. Jenny Rudesky is one of the people that worked on it, showing that um, if, a, if a parent is engrossed in their phone and a child is doing you know, the things that children do, toddlers, 
Um, the parent's going to be less skillful and kind of like they just don't know what happened. They're kind of like missing what's yeah. right in front of them. And then they're, you know, you're not doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing as a parent, which is help a kid respond to their environment, process emotions, and repair when they get upset. And so it just kind of like lowers the, the quality of parenting yeah. in the house. I've tried to, when I'm playing with Charlie, like put my phone away. I obviously do not always succeed, but it really hit me the other day when I was like on my phone and he was playing and then he just sort of like looked at me and was like, hi, daddy. Hi, daddy. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, because I'm on my fucking phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and then I was like, all right, put this thing away. <laughs> One of my favorite studies on this was done by an economist and it it showed where like so like when the when the iPhone came and there wasn't 3G everywhere it kind of was like you could see a natural experiment because there were some counties that had it some counties that didn't mm -hmm. and they documented a rise in playground injuries for young children which they attributed to the fact that oh, like God. the people watching them at the playground were on their phones <laughs> well, <laughs> that is that that one I'm less worried about because I'm such a helicopter parent and I'm like the anxious like I'm like following him around everywhere on the playground right round to make sure he doesn't fall. That's a whole other episode. But right, yeah, yeah, that is a whole other episode. Like I'm going to prevent him from ever, from ever falling. But that is a that's a that's scary that that's that's mm -hmm. happening. Um, how how do the risks change with age? Like as as kids get older, because that's another. I'm sure it's it's not equal for all ages at all. It absolutely isn't, and I mean. With all of this stuff, um, it's very important to recall kind of the – so there's like the dandelion versus orchid dichotomy. Like most of our kids are okay. Most of them are resilient to most circumstances and they're mm -hmm. like dandelions. They can do well in a lot of environments. Some of our kids are very sensitive. They're like orchids. Huh. They need special consideration, special treatment. And so there's no one kind of prescription that's going to really go for all kids and you really know your kid best. Right. Um that's a bottom line. That said, like across populations, um, we do see kind of um, interference with screens and bedtime. That's a huge issue. Um, and, and especially because the screen, you know, there's the light that shines in your eyes. There's the stimulating content. And, um, and kids tend to not do as well when they have televisions in their bedrooms, when they have, you know, access to screens kind of at all hours. And that's huge because it interferes with like, I mean, kids need sleep really a lot when they're developing, when their brains are developing to learn. Um, so, you know, that's that's a major area of focus. And then there's some research about like eating and screens, like um, the messages that come, like it's interesting because kids aren't watching as much commercial television. They're watching more videos on YouTube. And so yeah. it's not as like, it's not the same as it was like Saturday morning cartoons when we were kids, but there's still some evidence that shows that like screens promote mindless eating, um, and uh, uh, there's some correlation with obesity there. Uh, those are the two major areas where there's the strongest amount of evidence. And then getting into like, older kids, you talk start talking about social interactions and mental health effects, and, and we can kind of get into that. Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. Summer is the most fun when you can savor every moment. So why spend it drinking a light beer you don't actually enjoy? Don't do that. Don't do that. What you want to drink is a beer that has that special orange flavor. Mm -hmm. That's just refreshing citrusy brew. Mm -hmm. That we all know that Blue Moon sitting has. Sitting on a porch, sitting outside somewhere. That a porch is good. Veranda. Yeah, maybe. Um, maybe you're just hanging out by the pool. Sure. Gazebo. Yeah, you're doing that. Uh, Bloom pergola. Uh, pergola. Maybe there's a pergola involved. Maybe you're at the ballpark where Blue Moon was born. Blue Moon Light Sky is a refreshingly Mezzanine. flavorful light beer. It's so good you'll want to savor every sip. Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat and Tropical Wheat are two refreshingly light citrusy wheat beers. Checking in at just 95 calories per 12 ounces. Get Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat and Light Sky Tropical Wheat delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline. Blue Moon Light Sky. Savor every sip. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Today's episode is sponsored in part by Seeker, a new independent search engine that prioritizes transparency, choice, and control, streamlining your access to reliable information online. Just think. No more clickbait, no more hidden agendas, no more spreading misinformation. Seeker helps users know before they click. Here's how it works. Each news article that comes up when you search has its own Seeker score, a rating that determines how reliable an article is based on the following criteria. Subjectivity, clickbait, incoherence, and title exaggeration. The higher the article score on these criteria, the lower the Seeker score. You can also filter your search results by their political leaning. So whether you're searching for something left, right, or center, Seeker makes it easy to get all sides of the story. We love Seeker. Uh, 
Tommy always sets his incoherence meter for ten blah, 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 through the roof. Yeah, just doesn't want to doesn't want to understand it at all. Just yeah. being gibberish. Shifting incoherence from stun to kill. <laughs> <laughs> I said it's a Candace Owens. With Seeker, you can finally start to feel good about what you read. We love Seeker. Use it all the time. It really helps filters out the garbage. To get started, visit Seeker.com slash crooked to know that we sent you. That's S-E-E-K-R dot com slash crooked. Seek for yourself today because transparency matters. Offline is brought to you by Haya. Typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved super-powered chewable vitamin. While most children's vitamins are filled with 5 grams of sugar and can contribute to a variety of health issues, Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk, yet it tastes great and is perfect for picky eaters. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. Uh, it's a great vitamin. Uh, you don't want to, you know, look, when we were growing up, there was a certain brand of vitamins that uh, that kids always ate. They tasted good, but there were plenty of sugar and a lot of crap in them. Now that we have higher vitamins, you know, we're starting Charlie off right with vitamins that uh, that are that are good for him, but without all the sugar. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash offline. This deal is not available on their wet regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash offline and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Yeah, so so limiting screen time or maybe no screens for like a couple hours before bed, probably a good idea. And then... Um, We've been trying to do this too, that like when we're eating to make sure that everything's off so we can actually have a conversation. It's funny you said that about the ads though, because you're right, like Charlie now wants to watch like YouTube videos and then when they're interrupted by an ad, he now he just goes, ad, ad. <laughs> <laughs> like like I'm just yeah. going to like click because <laughs> you can skip the ad. I was like, okay. Right, right. <laughs> do the risks differ between types of screen? Is there any research on that? Like does a television differ from a phone or a laptop or an iPad? Absolutely. They all have totally different um, kind of affordances, right? So oddly enough, like there was, you know, from the 1950s on, there was a lot of panic about television and the impact, the moral impact of television and addiction to television. But now it's like flipped around because families that sit and watch a screen together, that's kind of like the nostalgic thing (laughs) that is like actually can promote bonding and conversation. And it's actually, I mean, it is considered potentially a positive family activity, especially if you choose carefully, if you're watching with your tween kids Mm. and you talk about what's on the screen. I mean, any kind of conversation, any kind of media that promotes parent-child interaction can be good. It can help build vocabulary. It can help build kind of mental concepts. So that's that's kind of TV, um, weirdly. Weirdly, TV became a hero, right? Which is very Um, funny. (laughs) Mobile devices, our problem with them is they go everywhere, right? There's no boundaries. They can go in the bath. They can go in the mealtime. They go, they, you know, they interfere when you're like having, going on outings. And so thinking about like when you want to have them, when you don't want to have them is a big thing. And then you kind of think about apps, right? Um, apps and games, which have all these rewards built in, they kind of this the addictive structure, and um, they can be they can promote some kinds of dependency um, mm. with with those things, apps and games. So the pandemic, of course, meant a lot more screen time for everyone, especially kids. Uh, you wrote a New York Times piece in July of 2020 titled "I Was a Screen Time Expert." Then the coronavirus happened. Where you actually apologized to any parents who'd felt judged or shamed by past implications that they weren't enforcing uh, healthy screen time balance. How did the pandemic change your views about kids and screens? I think what it really made obvious and visible to me is that the the way that we talk about parenting in America is so blinkered with privilege, Mm. right? Like we sort of, the whole idea that the bringing up of children is an activity called parenting and that people, individual families should be optimizing their children's experience rather than it be a collective responsibility that we all need to ensure is happening for every single child, regardless of their, whether their parents have time to read a goddamn book or not, you know, why are we not making a safe environment for all of our kids? And the pandemic just intensified that so much. And it put so much on individual families with very, very little help from the outside. And you know, like I, I knew, I knew intellectually that I was like, 
recommendations like, you know, turn off the screens an hour before bedtime. If you're a single parent and you're working the night shift and, a, you know, a family member is taking care of your kid, you have no jurisdiction ability to enforce these limits. Right. It's a pipe dream, right? Mm-hmm. So we have structural issues to fix before we start talking about what's optimal for kids with regards to screens. And I guess the pandemic was a, a leveling event in that way that exactly. even more privileged families who were used to being able to enforce those rules, suddenly you're all stuck at home. I mean, it was interesting to me because, you know, Charlie was a, a baby. He was born in July of 2020. And yeah. so we didn't, we were privileged and didn't experience the like both parents working while the kids are running around. But I will say we we all finally got COVID a month ago and now mm-hmm. he's almost two. And even just being together stuck for seven to 10 days in the house during our, during our quarantine, Emily and I both had such appreciation for all of the parents over the last several years who were working nonstop in a home with kids who were five, six, seven, eight, nine running around and trying to parent while you're working without any help. Like, I don't know how people did that. That's, that's, and that's, and, and as you point out, like for, for most people in this country, that's, that's life almost every day outside of a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have a child care crisis. And um, I mean, I ended up writing a whole other book about kind of parents' experiences during the pandemic because it was so glaring how much we failed to put children in our priority list, really. They weren't even there, like not even top bottom. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the key thing is, though, to remember that it's not really about the dosage of screens. It's, It's really about like the whole environment and the whole context in which you're raising kids. Like Mm. having, you know, you could have a kid who is, you know, never exposed to media, but their parents are completely stressed out all the time and depressed and angry because they're overextended. And that's not necessarily better for your kid. Um, You know, and and the reality is that we have trade-offs in our day. And for example, like, you know, if if you put your kid in front of a television so you can cook them like a nice organic meal, that's one trade-off. Or you spend that time doing a puzzle and you eat McDonald's for dinner. That's another trade-off. Right, yeah. And and the parent could argue either way. Like those things could be the right thing for your family in that moment. What does the kid need? Do they need the one-on-one time with you? Or would you prefer to give them the the, like balanced meal? Yeah. I mean, I I heard you say something that I, I love, which is that it's not necessarily about time on a device. It's about the relationship you have to that device. Can you say more about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the way that um, the, you know, the people who are doing really good research on this stuff talk about it is they talk about problematic media use. And really what it has to do with is um, what role is that media fulfilling in your life, right? So they use a scale that's borrowed from gambling addiction, which is a behavioral addiction. And it has to do with like, is this the one thing that the kid asks for, the one thing that they want, the one thing that makes them feel better when nothing else will, the one thing that they are willing to neglect other things in order to do it? Are they going to break the rules, sneak around? You know, do they have that level of obsession with it? Mm. And that's, those are the kinds of red flags, you know? And I think it's very, um, you know, easy to kind of understand it because we've all been through dark moments in our lives. I think when we're over relying on whether it's screens or anything else, to get through the day. But that's what we're kind of looking for is those patterns of emotional attachment when it comes to our kids and media. And in, in, your, in your New York Times op-ed um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, you had some great advice for parents. And um, one of them, there was, a, I believe, a, a doctor told you, his name was Ken Perlin, uh, talk, talking about connecting with other people. And he said, all we care about is whatever is going on between me and another person. Any medium that enriches that is successful any medium that replaces that is a failure. I thought that's mm-hmm. interesting. So that it, so electronic devices, digital devices are okay if they are sort of fostering greater connections with other human beings for kids and less okay if it's just like some kid playing a game. Is that is that what he meant? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it gets very complicated because, you know, uh, and during the pandemic, a lot of our kids were using platforms like Roblox to socialize with each other. Mm-hmm. And keep those relationships up. And I think that had a lot of really positive benefits. But, you know, I think that the overarching thing for parents is that we're always told how to say no and that good parents say no, but we're not given enough examples of what saying yes can look like. And, Mm. you know, watching a funny TikTok with your kid or looking something up online to answer a question that you both have or, you know, merely just asking your kid what they did online today is something that we need a good um, a good paradigm for. And, and one of the experts in my book was saying, like, 
everybody knows what a soccer mom is or soccer dad. They bring the orange slices. They cheer on the sidelines. Like they <laughs> they say, great game. But what is a Minecraft mom? Yeah. You know, I've started to have that instinct as sometimes if I'm sitting on the couch with Charlie and he's watching something on, on TV for a few minutes, I always want to like ask him like, what did you think of that? What is that character doing? Why do you like that? Oh, is that the garbage truck you like? What's the garbage truck doing, right? Just because I'm yeah. feeling, I like, I was like, us, the two of us just zoning out, him watching this and me and my phone can't be good. <laughs> like, but some kind of interaction with each other about what we're watching seems like it's a more, it's a healthier outcome. That's spot on. That's exactly what the experts would tell you to do. I mean, not that you're like chattering in the kid's ear constantly. Like they're okay. They're allowed to be like. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to overdo it either. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always. I mean, parents are always trying to overdo stuff. But like, but having that interaction, building that literacy and that that kind of character literacy, emotional literacy, especially if you're raising a little boy. Like, why do you think? How does he feel right now? Why do you think he feels that way? Yeah, um, try to do a lot of that. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, it's great. Like, it's it's really great. It's not that different from a picture book. Like what really matters is the conversation that you're having and the way that you get to know your kid through their enthusiasms. And by the way, that's what's so important when they get towards puberty and they want to start to hide their lives from you. Mm. If you have that established line of communication about what they are doing online, what they're enjoying in media, it can open up so much when they get to that level where they're doing stuff that we don't, you know, we're worried about. That's a smart point. Um, so I think the question on every parent's mind is like, how do we encourage these healthy relationships? And, and you know, you've talked about this. It seems like there's two basic strategies. Um, one is regulating your kids' screen time, and the other is teaching them to self-regulate. Uh, just to start mm-hmm. with the first one, like, what are some of the healthy ways to set rules and boundaries for kids with screens? So um, we kind of talked about the the big uh, North Stars, protecting sleep and the mm-hmm. bedtime and um, trying to have some screen-free family time, especially around meals. Um, looking at the kids' overall schedule and rhythm and routine, you know, you also want to have in, you want to have the homework time, the outdoor time, the time with friends, and then hopefully screens kind of fit in with, with these other things that you're doing. Um, that's kind of the, the big picture. Now, in terms of strategy, I'm just a big proponent of buy-in, you know, talking to kids, helping them make up rules together. You'd be surprised, even a very young child can kind of talk to you about strategies and rules, um, and then you can have the external structure things. So having a certain place designated for the for the screens, um, a chargers go in a certain place, mm. having visual calendars, reminders, passes, um, you know, where so people can see or the visual schedule where people can see like where the screens come in and everybody knows it using a timer. I use a timer on my kitchen stove constantly. Yeah. Um, we've done the timer a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Five oh, more minutes, like five more minutes best. and then we're going to have dinner. <laughs> it is your best friend. Cause em- it's like, it's not me that said it. It's the, it's the ringer. No, like, Emily do that. does that a lot. And that's, that's, that's been very <laughs> useful. Um, and this seems like the more difficult one, but probably the more productive, which is teaching kids to self-regulate when it comes to screens. How do, how do you do that? Well, if they never get a chance to do it, they're not going to develop it. If you're always the external force, mm. then they never get a chance to do it. Um, so, you know, teaching self-regulation can be pretty tricky, um, but it can be as simple as kind of like prompting a moment of reflection. So, um, for example, you know, when we're talking about cookies, right, it's like, how do you know when you're full? Okay, do you does your body really want another cookie right now? Just getting them, and of course they're gonna be like, yes, it does, and they're grab the cookie. Yeah. But like over time, that kind of question gets insinuated, and it becomes kind of part of the process. Okay. Um, and you know the other thing with self regulation, you know, it's sort of a, a extreme idea, but some people I know have tried it with success to be like, we're gonna have a no holds barred day where you decide how your screen use is gonna go, hmm. and then let's see how you feel. Uh, but that's that's a way to do it. Yeah, it's like uh, eat all the junk food you want for a day, and then we'll then we'll, then we'll talk about yeah. how your stomach feels. <laughs> Offline is brought to you by Fume. We talk about communication and connection a lot on this show. I know a few people that smoke or vape, and I'm sure you do too. How does that habit cut into our connection with that person? Uh, it it does. No one. It's it's smoking is gross. Mm, you know? Cigarettes are gross. Yeah, and they're bad for you. And they're bad for you, but they're especially gross. But they're and they're even more especially bad for you. And and then you think about how gross they are. <laughs> we know about the health risks, but as smoking has evolved from a casual habit to something that's taken over your life, you got to check out Fume. 
Fume is a natural inhaler designed for a better, safer, and natural way to quit cigarettes. It's no smoke, no vape, and no nicotine replacement for the hand-to-mouth habit of smoking. For most people, quitting cold turkey doesn't work. So Fume handcrafted these wooden inhalers infused with plant oils studied to curb cravings. They have core flavors like peppermint with minty notes and lemonberry bliss for a sweeter experience. All their flavors are 100% natural, no harmful chemicals, no artificial flavors, and no nicotine. They've got thousands of five-star reviews from smokers who tried everything else until this worked for them. You know, you have all these friends. I told a friend to use Fume, and they were so impressed. It, uh, it actually really worked, helped ease the cravings. And then, you know, uh, if you're looking for an alternative to patches or pills, Fume combines the benefits of plants and behavioral science to distract smokers from their cravings in a natural way. Whether you're a smoker or ex-smoker who still struggles with cravings, Fume is on a mission to help one million people quit smoking by 2025. Head to breathethefume.com slash crooked and use promo code crooked to save 10% off your entire order. That's 10% off your entire order when you head to B-R-E-A-T-H-E-F-U-M dot com slash crooked and use the code crooked. Offline is brought to you by Future. Future believes that people motivate people. And having your own future coach isn't just the best approach. It's the only sustainable approach to your health and fitness. Future has built the most talented team of fitness coaches on the planet. And when you join Future, you get paired with the one that's right for you, your goals, and your experience. Future provides you with your own expert coach who gives you personalized daily coaching and a workout plan built just for you all through the Future app. Future coaches are your experts, partners in fitness. And regardless of how often you work out, your future coach will be there for you every day. Like my boy Gabe, he's there for me every day. Gives me a little push when I need it. Ask me how the workout was. Ask me what I want to change about it. Gives me a whole bunch of new workouts the next week. Works great. And you look great. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Future isn't a fancy... Keeping it tight. (laughs) Future isn't a fancy piece of equipment. This isn't a get fit quick plan. And this isn't a YouTube video. With daily coaching and tailored workout plans, your future coach will support you through every step of your fitness journey. There's no risk to try Future. And right now, you can get 50% off your first three months and cancel any time during the first 30 days at tryfuture.com slash crooked. That's tryfuture.com slash crooked. Hey, everyone. It's John Favreau here. If you're anything like me, you've binged many of the latest Amazon originals streaming on Prime Video. Now, whenever I finish watching a series or movie, I always want to hear the behind the scenes stories of how these ideas were brought to life. And that's exactly what's done on Prime Video Presents. Join host Tim Cash as he sits down with some amazing creative talent to talk about the real-life inspirations and experiences that made some really special Amazon originals possible. He has conversations with actress Marin Hinkle from The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Tracy Oliver, the creator of Harlem, icon J.K. Simmons about being the king of Amazon originals, and many more. Listen to the actors, writers, and creators behind your favorite Amazon originals like you've never heard them before. This is Prime Video Presents... New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen now and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We talked a little bit about, at the beginning, about sort of the most important relationship is like parents with their own phones. Um, Like, what's your relationship with your phone like when your children are around? Have you set, like, rules for yourself? How how have your habits changed since you started doing this reporting and writing? Um, Well, I would say that I'm not the paragon by any means. I'm definitely a person who uses a lot of social media and who's connected a lot of the time for work. Um, But I really do try hard and I kind of prompt that conversation where, you know, we keep our mealtimes pretty designated. We have uh, times that are, you know, screen-free, free free time during the day, like on the weekday and then on the weekends as well. So, you know, but it's really more of an atmosphere where like my kids can also ask me for the time, like if they need me to put my phone away Mm -hmm. or, you know, if I'm asking them to put the phone away, they can ask me to put the phone away too. Yeah. And, and trying to make sure that they're keeping me honest. But sense. honestly, it's a work in progress because the kids get older, you know, everybody kind of, their your routines and your rhythms change. Right. You got to just keep adjusting. Um, yeah. Pandemic meant a lot more screen time for kids. It also meant a lot less school time, at least in person. Uh, you mentioned the new book that you're writing now about the pandemic's effects on children uh, called The Stolen Year. What have you learned so far from that book? I mean, I feel like this is going to be some of the longest lasting impacts of the pandemic as a social phenomenon is the way that we push our kids off of their developmental trajectories. They have lost learning time. They have lost social time. There has been a mental health um, implosion among many young people. Um, And then the way that we kind of allowed families to suffer economically as well by pushing Mm. mothers out of the workforce and First, we extended economic um, help and then we withdrew it and we kind of like left families, you know, worse off than they were at the beginning. Um, So, you know, it's a real um, 
it was a real heartbreaker to witness and be a part of at the same time. And I think what's dangerous to me now is, I mean, we're just starting to get the real evidence. I mean, people who watched these things knew that um, the pandemic was going to have a severe impact on kids learning and social development, but the numbers are coming in now. And there's such an urge to kind of write it off or wa- or, or, or wash it away or yeah. rush back to normal. And I just don't want us to do that because we need to deal with this because we're going to be dealing with this for another decade at least. It, it, this, this issue has really concerned me because I also think that, that the danger here is that it's fallen into these partisan buckets, right? Where like if you – if you're concerned about what the pandemic sent to kids and then that goes to school closures, then you're someone who didn't take the pandemic seriously enough. And that's that was, you know, that was the Republican side. And then the Democratic side is like, we took the pandemic very seriously and it was necessary to school to close the schools. But the truth is, like, yes, we needed to take the pandemic very seriously, but also there's incredible damage being done to kids that has been done to kids by by closing schools and when we were talking about this, everything has trade-offs and thinking about those trade-offs in a really critical way and and trying to like push the politics out of it and just think about sort of what's best for kids and what are the risks that we're sort of willing to bear and how if you close a school or not close a school, there are, there are plenty of risks either way. There's risk to health and then there's risk to learning. Um, I don't think that we've really, uh, we've given that sort of the thoughtful public debate that it deserves. I, I, the, this, the closing off of the public conversation about it was very heart wrenching to watch. Um, and as someone who, you know, I was working for National Public Radio, we're not a polarizing right. um, voice in media. Um, and I was trying to quote unquote follow the science. And I think actually my work in the art of screen time helped me understand that the science is obviously a moving thing and communicating yeah. the science to the public as a whole other thing. But the bottom line is, John, like, no other country did what we did. We mm. did not have. Yeah any jurisdiction in the United States that ever closed bars and opened schools. Right. We either had Florida open everything up or we had cities all over this country with open dog parks, closed playgrounds, open bars, open restaurants, closed schools. And that is not justifiable. Yeah. I, like I, from a public health science or moral perspective. Well, and look, like I think that there's a, there's a time at the beginning of the pandemic and, and particularly a time before vaccines where you were like, we didn't know the, we, we didn't know what the science was. There wasn't enough research and there's a deadly pandemic. And so, yes, we're going to do whatever we can. We're going to, you know, even then a lot, you know, bars and restaurants tended to be, <laughs> tend to be open, which is, of, of course, we make the decision that like, you know, uh, that we're going to let capitalism continue, <laughs> right? We're going to make sure the bars and restaurants are open, but we could close the schools so we're closing the schools. But I do think then it got to the point where there was enough science in and we started looking you know, at the risks for kids and stuff like that. And it, it just, I mean, it seems like remote learning w- was mostly a failure, um, but Absolutely. I don't know what you've seen from your research. You've been writing this book. Um, well, first of all, I just want to address the timeline for a sec because Europe started opening their schools in April of 2020. Mm. And Europe, the European equivalent of the CDC was full-throated at, on the need to open schools and the fact that open, opening schools could be done safely. Wow. So we have a real divergence there. It's also the case, one thing that I reported on was, you know, not every childcare center could close in the U.S. because doctors had to go to work. And so, for example, in New York City, there were 100,000 children of essential workers going to school in school buildings from the first days of lockdown. Uh, I didn't think so about that. So not only did we have con- – we had actual real-life data of what happens if you follow protocols and you kid kids in co- cohorts and you have masks. Not only – so it was New York City. There were um, – across the country in YMCAs, there were – children were congregating with adults. And those – environments were not high spread environments, even when they didn't know anything, even more the CDC had put out any guidance. They were like, well, we are going to try this and th- because they had to. And they did. And by July 2020, we had pretty good evidence from Europe and from our own experience in the US that it was possible to keep spread down. And with a really concerted effort and good public communication, we could have built confidence in those measures. And we could have given schools what they needed to stay to open and stay open safely. That's my belief. It, yeah. it would have taken a whole lot of things to go differently, but it could have happened. 
Yeah, and like so much of the pandemic, the communications become the communication becomes difficult. It becomes difficult to have a public conversation that is not like riven by politics. Um, it like trust in institutions, which started off very low before the pandemic, became even worse during the pandemic. No matter how how hard people were trying to get things right, like it's just it was a real, real mess. It's a real mess, and, and, and I do worry about like. I've been talking about this a lot, having having a child now, just the long... I mean, I think Charlie was is at the age where it, it was okay for him to not see kids because he was, on you know, one year old when this was going on. But uh, I have friends with, with children who were four, five, six, seven, eight, and have noticed a difference in how they socialize and how they're developing because they haven't been around friends and they haven't been around other, other children. And I don't know how you fix that. I mean, that's a pretty scary thing. Uh, it's going to take time and sensitivity and what we didn't do, which is prioritizing kids' needs. I mean, there is a, uh, you know, the, the Surgeon General declared a children a pediatric mental health emergency. Yeah. But part of that had to do with we never had the personnel that we needed to serve kids' needs. And it was taking ki- taking months and even years for children and adolescents with, with psychiatric problems to see and get the treatment that they needed. And the pandemic just made that a thousand times worse. Yeah. But I, what I don't see is like the massive federal investment in training, men, you know, pediatric mental health professionals to get them into those seats so that we can start to have the beds that we need to treat kids and the counseling that we need to treat kids. Or the investment in public schools in general and education. And, <laughs> you know, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> yes. But, but yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah. we're all living through a, a pretty difficult and turbulent moment right now. Um, many kids, as we've talked about, are experiencing this, that turbulence themselves. Many of them are seeing it on their screens. What's the most important lesson you've learned as a parent, a reporter, now an expert on this subject, about how to help kids cope and thrive in times like these? That's a great question. So... What I believe really strongly is that we don't make a better world for our kids by not talking to them about the hard stuff. Mm. I think that there is, whether it's a school shooting, whether it's climate change, whether it's the impact of the pandemic, um, there are ways to talk about all of these things and to deliver the message that I am here for you. I care. It's okay to have big feelings. We deal with our feelings. We have a toolbox for dealing with them. And the fantastic thing about it is, you know, I followed five families in depth throughout the pan- the first pandemic year. And these are families, you know, some of them in really tough circumstances, but they all received moments of kind of grace and clarity just from having that extra time together. And it's such a sad thing because we force so many parents away from their kids and into the workplace and long hours. And just that they all appreciated, every parent that I talked to appreciated the time that they had. And it gave them a new perspective on who they were as parents, their resilience, and on their kids' resilience. And like, I am the farthest thing from a Pollyanna. Mm -hmm. But the reason I care so much and the reason I, you know, spend all my time thinking about children is like, children are this long-term upside opportunity. You invest in a kid today and you get that you get the return on that investment for decades to come. Mm. And the same thing is true for, you know, kids go through tough times, they have the ability, ability, it doesn't mean it's a certainty to bounce back. If they get the investment, if they get the time, if they get the love and the care, they can come back. And I think that there is such a huge opportunity for the kids of this pandemic generation to be able to incorporated into their lives and their life stories and to who they become as adults and say, yeah, I went through a really intense time, but I'm stronger because of it. And that's part of the story that we're going to have to help them tell by actually doing it, actually doing what it takes to repair and to make it better. Yeah. And the most, and we, there's a lot of things we can't control, but what we can control is like whether we're there from that for them and listening to them. And, and you, you ended the op-ed with that where you can, you can't, you can control giving them a hug, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right? right? You can be there. You can be there next to them. Um, Anya Kamenetz, thank you so much for, for joining offline. This was a, this was a wonderful conversation and uh, appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. 